I have to admit, I had forgotten all of that. <laughs> Thank you. I do have pictures of both me and Sharon on the dig, but I did not bring them, so. Well, they didn't tell me this was going to be a roast tonight, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you for that wonderful introduction, which um, I've never had an introduction quite like that before. <laughs> I hope I don't ever again, <laughs> but thank you so much. In fact, thank you, and thank you to the program committee and to the committee chairs for the invitation to speak tonight, and thank all of you for being here. Now, can you all hear me? We're all good? Okay, how are you all doing? Everybody good? You're looking forward to a good set of meetings? I'm, I am too, so I just have to get through tonight, then I'll be good. Yeah. All right, so, let me move this down, there we go. So, I was talking back in March to a guy whom we had just hired to feed our cats while we were away from home. This guy, whose name is Ivan, asked what I do for a living. And when I told him that I'm an archaeologist, his first question was about giants, specifically those mentioned in the Bible. It seems that Ivan had just watched a show about biblical giants on TV the night before, and he was wondering if it was accurate. He then asked me about all sorts of other things, including about the claims made in other shows that he had recently seen on TV as well. Now, I'm asked the same sorts of things by the handyman who stops by every so often to clean the gutters on our house. Uh, we affectionately call him Smelly Mike, but he doesn't know that, so <laughs> please don't tell him. That's just between us here tonight, okay? Uh, and some years ago, a distant cousin of mine, Reuben, cornered me at a bar mitzvah and asked if I knew where the Ark of the Covenant is now. Now, I'm quite sure that I'm not alone in having such encounters. Undoubtedly, they happen to many of you as well. But I offer them as three examples of members of the general public, Ivan, Reuben, and Smelly Mike, should be our target audience, but when they go to the bookstore or online to Amazon, for the most part, they don't see books that are written by us meant for them. So instead, they're buying the books that are written by non-archaeologists, most of whom have learned how to write for the general public. And this, I say, must change. It's as simple as that. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity and this platform to sound a call to arms, and to ask all of you to begin writing more things aimed at the general public. Now, they don't have to be books. They can be tweets, blog posts, articles for a &E Today, for Medium, for the Huffington Post. But I do think it's absolutely imperative that we all do so, especially if our academic field is going to survive in this day and age. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we might go about doing that. Now, writing for the general public was once fairly commonplace. Previous generations of Near Eastern archaeologists knew full well the need to bring their work before the eyes of the world. Think of the books that V. Gordon Child wrote for the public, including Man Makes Himself and New Light on the Most Ancient East. He also wrote What Happened in History, which reportedly he opted to have published by Penguin Books, which is here Pelican Books, instead of Oxford University Press, so that it would be cheaper and could thus more easily reach the masses, as he called the general public. Think also of Sir Leonard Woolley's books, including Dead Towns and Living Men, Digging Up the Past, and A Forgotten Kingdom. Think of Gertrude Bell and her book, The Desert and the Sown, as well as others that she wrote. And think back to James Henry Breasted and his book, Ancient Times, A History of the Early World. Abigail Rockefeller read that book and she told her husband, John D. Rockefeller Jr. about it. And that led directly to him giving a lot of money, millions of dollars in today's terms, to Breasted in order to found the Oriental Institute 
at the University of Chicago, which is celebrating its centennial this year. And he also funded most of the seasons of excavation at Megiddo from 1925 to 39. Breasted even made a movie. Some of you may have seen it. It's called The Human Adventure. And it, it featured the exploits of the Oriental Institute, including their excavations in four different countries. It debuted at Carnegie Hall. And it then played around the country in the 1930s. And if you want to go see it, it's up on the Oriental Institute's YouTube channel. Now, think also, let me see if I, yeah, think also of William F. Albright and his book, From the Stone Age to Christianity, and of Yigal Yudin and his coffee table book on Masada, as well as his book on Hatzor. And think of Dame Kathleen Kenyon's books, Digging Up Jericho and Digging Up Jerusalem, as well as, of course, archaeology and the Holy Land. Now, there were a whole host of other famous archaeologists who lectured widely and wrote prolifically. And there were others like the British archaeologist Glenn Daniel, who hosted the BBC TV series Animal, Vegetable, Mineral in the 1950s. That show featured Sir Mortimer Wheeler, who was voted TV Personality of the Year in 1954. <laughs> and Glenn Daniel won the same award the very next year. <clears throat> there was also an American version called What in the World that was developed by Froelich Rainey the director of the Penn Museum, and it featured archaeological objects. That show ran for 15 years in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, some of these scholars were more successful than others at reaching the public, and some of their books are more accessible than others, for I must admit that some are quite densely written. However, many of them began their books by saying why they were writing them. For example, in 1914, Breasted wrote the following in the introduction to Ancient Times, the book that so influenced the Rockefellers. And he says, and I quote, in the selection of subject matter as well as in style and diction, it has been the purpose of the author to make this book sufficiently simple to be put into the hands of first year high school pupils. A great deal of labor has been devoted to the mere task of clear and simple statement and arrangement. While simple enough for first year high school work, it nevertheless is planned to interest and stimulate all students of high school age. Now having read this book, I must admit to being a bit stunned that he was aiming it at first year high school students, but it is certainly written at a level that can be easily read and understood by current college students, even though, of course, it's vastly out of date at this point. The other scholars said similar things in their introductions, but I think you get the point. It's interesting now to read through these books, which were so deliberately aimed at the general public and written by some of the biggest names in the field. The public was hungry for accurate information back then and I would argue it is still hungry for it now. And I dare say that the members of the general public who are here tonight would probably wholeheartedly agree. And yet, with a few exceptions, we have lost sight of this. Sacrifice to the goal of achieving tenure and other perceived institutional norms. In fact, we've left it to others to tell our stories for us and not always to our satisfaction. And the public, doesn't always know who or what to believe. I say, it's time for us to take control again. I believe it's time, long past time in fact, for us all, not just a few, but as many as possible, to once again begin telling our stories about our findings and presenting our archeological work in ways that make it relevant, interesting, and engaging to a broader audience, and in fact, it's fun to do so. Who doesn't want to talk to an audience that really wants to know what we're finding and what we think about the ancient world? Moreover, I would point out that ASOR's own professional conduct policy repeatedly calls for us to do exactly this. ASOR's mission statement, I realize this is too small for you to see, but I'll read you the appropriate parts. 
ASOR's mission statement says that we're supposed to encourage and support public understanding of the cultures and history of the Near East from the earliest times. It lists six things we're supposed to be doing, and number six is to offer educational opportunities in Near Eastern history and archaeology through outreach to the general public. Now, obviously, this can take a number of different forms, including lectures, but the policy then goes on to specify, in particular, dissemination of knowledge through publication, which includes the use of venues and languages accessible to the general public. This is part of the very fabric of who we are. Our own policy specifies we should be writing things aimed at the general public, in addition to our more traditional output of scholarly articles and books. But for the most part, we have gotten away from this. There are some ASOR members, of course, who are already doing this, including some of you who are here tonight. Just look at Jody Magnus and her new book on Masada, which came out this past May. Look at Sarah Parkak with her book on satellite imagery that was published this past July. In fact, speaking of Sarah Parkak, she's the only one of us that I know of who has appeared on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. And Kara Cooney is the only one to have appeared on The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson. We need more, more, more. We're a long way from the days of Glenn Daniel, Mortimer Wheeler, and Froelich Rainey. In fact, what I think we're also lacking these days, and have been for quite a while, are more of what I would call public-facing scholars in our field. Other fields have had them. Margaret Mead, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, Mary Leakey, Jacques Cousteau, Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and others. Nowadays, such people are often referred to as public intellectuals. Personally, I prefer the term public-facing scholars as being more accurate, and it also, quite frankly, doesn't sound as elitist. They comment upon their area of expertise and strive to present their work and make it accessible to the general public. Some of them do get in trouble by commenting on things outside their specialty, but when they stay within their area of expertise, their opinions and interpretations are very important and are essential in terms of conveying information to the general public in an accessible way. In fact, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed back in October 2017, uh, Devoni Lucer wrote, more academics need to embrace the public intellectual role. It's good for our careers, and it's good for our institutions and disciplines as well as for the public. Whatever you want to call them, we need more of them in archaeology. We need more in ancient history. We need more in religious studies, and we need more in the related disciplines. At the moment, I see mainly Candida Moss fulfilling that role as a frequent commentator on religious topics for various TV channels. And Bob Cargill and Mark Goodacre also appear on various TV shows, especially about the New Testament. They're all doing a great job, but we need more people to join them, especially more ASOR people. And I would also single out Aaron Mayer for his tremendous effort in teaching an entire class on biblical archaeology on the internet recently, which reached literally thousands of people. And I sincerely hope that he's t thinking about turning it into a popular book. Now, returning to the topic of other ASOR members who have written for the public, Amnon Bentor, of course, has done a general book on Hatsor. David Yushishkin's written general books about Lachish and now Megiddo. Oded Borowski did one called Daily Life in Biblical Times and another called Agriculture in Iron Age Israel. Lisa Cooper has written about Gertrude Bell. Rachel Hallett has done one on Frederick Bliss. Bill Deaver of course, has been extremely prolific in this regard with a number of books in recent years. And Neil Silverman, to whom I spoke when I first thought about trying to write popularizing books, and several times since then, has written important and accessible books on Yigal Yudin, the history of biblical archaeology, and numerous other topics. And of course, he and Israel Finkelstein wrote the best-selling book, the Bible Unearthed, as well as a book on David and Solomon. Both are aimed at general audiences. There are others out you, of you out there as well, and I apologize for not having time to highlight each and every one of you by name, but you know who you are. However, more of us 
many more of us need to bring our work to life for the public far more than we are currently doing. As I've said, it's time for us to once again begin to tell our own stories about our findings and our takes on the ancient world. Our livelihoods and the future of the field depend on it. For this is true not only for our lectures and writings for the general public, but also in our classrooms. You're all aware that the humanities are currently under attack and are threatened by funding cuts at many of our institutions, including at my own university. If we are unable to successfully engage our own students and to show both them and the university administrators that good research goes hand in hand with good teaching, good lecturing, and good writing, we will not only risk the future of our departments, but also fail to cultivate the next generation of archaeologists. And I think we would all agree that we don't want that to happen. In fact, that's exactly why the NEH began something called the Public Scholar Program a few years ago, to encourage us to write such books. These are grants they began awarding in 2015 specifically to support, and I quote, the creation of well-researched books in the humanities intended to reach a broad readership, end quote. And this is right from their own website. I got one the first year they were offered for my Megiddo book that will come out this coming March. And since then, Jody Magnus got one for her Masada book that has just been published. And now Elise Friedland has received one to work on a book on Greek and Roman influences on the architecture of Washington, D.C. Clearly, the NEH is aware of the need for those of us who work in the humanities and the social sciences to reach the public. And I would urge many of you to apply for this grant. The application information for the next set of awards just went live two weeks ago on the NEH website, and the application is not due until February 5th. So you have two and a half months to pull it together. As my friend and colleague Chris Ralston said to me, the only thing that can turn around the threats to the humanities is if we make the case for our field and demonstrate our relevance to society. But no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> and let me hasten to reassure those of you who are sitting in the audience and who may be thinking rather dubiously about this idea of writing for the public. And to you, I would say, you can do it. I know you can do it. Why and how do I know this? Because what we all really do for a living is tell stories, right? Think about that for just a minute, but it's pretty obvious. We all tell stories, whether we realize it or not. Yes, we do it especially in the classroom, but also at dinner parties and family gatherings as well, where people frequently perceive us as having a much more glamorous job than we actually do. Whether you're a pottery person, a faunal expert, a radiocarbon person, a skeletal or DNA expert, an underwater archaeologist or a land-based one, a bioarchaeologist, a text person, an epigrapher, an art historian, or whatever, we're all trying to figure out what happened back then, aren't we? We're all trying to figure that out. We're each digging at sites or investigating questions or working on problems that the public would be interested in learning about. In fact, we're all constantly telling stories about what we do or what we found or what we think happened back in some particular time period or some particular place or to some group of people. You already know that. It's quite literally what we all do for a living. And people want to hear what we have to say. There's no denying that. And actually, we need to embrace that fact. There are still people out there, lots and lots of people who are interested. They were there when Albright and Breasted and Woolley and Child and Bell and Yadin and Kenyon were writing and they're still there now. That's why Biblical Archaeology Review has been around for more than 40 years under Herschel Shanks and now Bob Cargill. That's why there are so many television documentaries constantly being made, most of them on the same topics over and over and over again. Troy and the Trojan War, Jericho, the Ark of the Covenant, <coughs> New Testament stories and so on. People are interested. They're really, really, really interested about the stuff that we do even if it doesn't actually include ancient aliens. <laughs> there is, quite simply, a hunger out there for stories about the ancient world, 
but I mean the real ancient world. Now, speaking of which, when I was invited to speak tonight, I was specifically asked to talk about how I've been able to present my work in a way that makes it relevant and interesting and able to be engaged by a broader audience. In short, how is it that I am able to take data that non-archaeologists might perceive to be dry or arcane and make it interesting to the general public? It's actually a very easy question for me to answer. Every time I'm putting together a lecture or writing something meant for the general public, I do it as if my wife's grandmother, Honey, is going to be in the audience or is going to read it. Now, her name was Ethel Schwartz, but we all called her Honey. Bless her heart, may she rest in peace. She passed away a few years ago, but she was my biggest fan and a passionate devotee of biblical archaeology. She had a subscription to Biblical Archaeology Review for decades and even had a letter to the editor published once. In fact, if you'll recall, when the ASOR meetings were in San Antonio back in the early 2000s, she asked me to introduce her to Herschel Shanks, and that was the absolute biggest thrill for her. She didn't want to meet any of you. She wanted to meet Herschel. <laughs> she was a very smart lady. She went to Northwestern University in the 1920s, enrolling as a freshman when she was 15 years old. She then lived the rest of her life back in El Paso. And she took classes on all sorts of topics at the local community college until she was well into her 80s. However, she would watch those shows on TV. You all know the ones I mean. And she would call me excitedly every time, saying things like, Eric, they found the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> and I would reply, again? So, Honey was my target audience, an interested, educated, smart layperson who really wanted to learn and who wanted to get answers to her questions, even if she eventually found out that there isn't a conclusive answer yet. I actually use the same mantra for writing books as I do when crafting my class lectures and my lectures to the general public. For lectures, for instance, my rule of thumb is always, if it's boring to me, it's going to be boring to them. So figure out how to make it not boring. In fact, I found every time that if something is interesting to me, I can make it interesting to them. So don't make it boring. Make it interesting. Tell it as a story. Pose it as a question to which they need to figure out the answer or that they need to discuss. Get them involved somehow, whether they're your students in a classroom, an audience listening to your lecture, or someone reading your book. So that's the short answer as to how I do it. Write or lecture as if you are doing so for a member of your family and make it interesting. Now, I can hear some of you, or most of you, still being hesitant. Go ahead and admit it. You're saying, even if I wanted to, I don't know what I would write a book about. I don't have any ideas for topics people want to hear. Am I right? How many fall into that category? There's more of you than are raising your hands. And again, I would say that you couldn't be more wrong. Of course you have ideas. You have lots of ideas. Where do such ideas come from? Anywhere and everywhere. Dining room table, the bar, the family reunion, the classroom. For instance, we're not forwarding here. There we go. My book, Eden to Exile, that Susan showed a picture of, it came out of a gig in which I was a consultant for a national geographic TV series and is based on questions I'm asked most frequently, like my cousin Reuben asking me where the Ark of the Covenant is now. Three Stones Make a Wall is based on the lectures I give in my intro to archaeology class, and the material in 1177 comes straight out of the lectures that I've been giving for years in my Ancient Near Eastern Egypt course and in my Aegean Bronze Age course. Now, I think, I think popular books on sites like Ashkelon and Heshbon and Gezer and Jezreel, and Safi, and Rehov, and other places would be of great interest to the general public. I think books on Starkey, and Crowfoot, and other early archaeologists would also be of great interest, like the one that Rachel Hallett wrote on Frederick Liss, and Lisa Cooper wrote about Gertrude Bell. What about, what about popularizing books on nomads? What about on agriculture and farming? On maritime archaeology? 
or on dozens of other topics that we could come up with in a matter of minutes in a brainstorming session. So think about what you're asked most often or about what you think is a really interesting find or a discovery that you've made and write something on that. Make them interested in that obscure aspect of your site which they hadn't heard about previously. I suspect, in fact, that actually nearly all of you have an idea or two for what you could write about. So I would encourage you to think for a moment and ask yourself, what topic would you choose if you were allowed to write about anything you wanted to? But we also need to keep in mind the general populace out there is pretty smart and they're pretty savvy as well. They appreciate a story that is told by a professional as long as it's told well and without too much jargon. However, it is sometimes hard for them to tell who's a professional and who isn't. We all grouse and grumble about pseudo-archaeologists, and sure, they are a problem, especially those who masquerade as professionals. But they're more of a problem because they're doing what we aren't. They know how to write for the public, and they are reaching them. So that's why I would argue the best way to counter them is not by going after them and trying to argue with them or debunk them. Trust me, I've tried that. It doesn't work. No, the single best way to counter the pseudo-archaeologists, in my opinion, is to put out our own books that tell about our finds and our hypotheses and our sites and simply outnumber them, swamp them with our stories, drown them with our data, humble them with our hypotheses, bury them with our books. <laughs> That's the way to do it. And you'll notice I'm deliberately not showing a slide with any of those books pictured. I won't kid you, though. It's not as easy as it might look. A few years ago, Patricia McEnany and Norm Yaffe put it bluntly. In the introduction to their edited volume entitled Questioning Collapse, they wrote, and I quote, our stories are not easy to construct and even harder to narrate to a public that's interested in what we do. Scholars' prose can become tortured, full of scholarly references to other researchers' efforts, and couched in conditional phrases such as could have or possibly, in order to express the uncertainty in understanding peoples and cultures remote in time and place. And this is all very true, as we know. Trying to tell a story while remaining true to our scientific values can be very difficult, as can the negotiations with your publisher about how many footnotes you can include and how lengthy your bibliography can be. And it's also simply easier to hide behind technological terms and academic jargon and impenetrable phrases and to justify it by saying that you're being scholarly. It's actually far more difficult, I think, to explain things clearly in simple and concise language so that anyone and everyone can understand it, including your wife's grandmother. But while it's not easy, we can do it. You can do it. In fact, I can see a lot of people here in this room right now, they could do it. I know you can do it, and we need to do it. It's in all of our best interest, as I've said, to do so, not least to ensure the future of the field, and to keep remembering that there are a lot of people out there who are interested in what we have to say. I don't need to remind all of you of the joy that we feel about this field. This is why we do it. If we didn't like it, we'd get out. And we try to pass that joy on to our students when we're teaching. But we also need to do it for the public in our writing and in our lectures. The public wants to know what we're thinking, but we're not giving it to them with a few notable exceptions. But I say that can easily be changed. In fact, I think that our academic book publishers need to rise up to the challenge and to create some new series specifically for trade books written by professionals and aimed at the general public. So my call to arms tonight is to them as well. Thames and Hudson used to have the Ancient Peoples and Place series back in the day. Princeton now has the Turning Points in Ancient History series, but we need more like that. Rutledge and Cambridge and Oxford and other university presses and private presses need to do the same. And in actuality, whether they will publicly admit it or not, many of the publishers out there are hungry for trade books that will sell to the general public. What publisher would not want to put out a book that will sell 10 or 20,000 copies, rather than to just 700 libraries and a few dozen scholars at most? Now, the scholarly books are tremendously important, please don't get me wrong, but the general public is hungry for books written for them as well, 
And frankly, there's a lot more of them than there are of us. And most of the acquiring editors are very happy to have you pitch ideas to them. After all, that's a huge part of their job, and that's actually, in part, why they have booths at conferences like this. Sure, they're trying to sell you books, but as many of you know, they're also here to chat with all of you about your ideas for future books. And that is how our volume, The Social Archaeology of the Levant, which Asafia Sorlando, York Rowan, and I edited, that's how it came into being, actually. It was born in the bar at the ASOR meetings about five years ago when we were having drinks with an acquisition editor from Cambridge University Press. The acquisition editors may also visit your campus and pick your brains for potential topics that either you or someone else could write about. Both represent opportunities for you to trot out those ideas that you've been harboring in the back of your mind or that you should have been harboring. And in turn, we professionals need to step up and agree to write these books, for in doing so, we will not only inspire the current generation, but also the next generation. I do realize, of course, that a lot of you are overcommitted to all sorts of other things, and it may be impossible right now for you to find the time. But this is something that can be done when you do have the time, even if it means waiting to do, until you retire. But I would urge you to do it, whether now, in a year or two, or a decade from now. For instance, you never know what impact your book will have on a youngster who is just beginning to explore the topics that interest them. That's what happened to me, and I'm amazed you didn't have this picture, Susan. <laughs> when I was seven years old, my mother gave me this book about Heinrich Schliemann and his excavations at Troy. After reading it, I declared then and there that I was going to be an archeologist. I still have that book because my mother gave it to me again when I graduated from Dartmouth with my degree in archeology. span And it's in my office at GW today. So was it a book that influenced you as a youngster or as a young adult to become an archeologist? Forget about watching Indiana Jones. How many of you read a book or books about archeology span at an early age and decided that's what you wanted to do? Can I see a show of hands? Does that happen to anybody else? Yeah. If so, do you remember what book it was? And have you gone back recently and looked at it again to see what was so special about it? It's tough to write for young adults, but perhaps some of you would be more comfortable doing that and getting to them while they're younger. And that's perfectly fine. I've done it myself twice now, but not on my own. I had a lot of help. Back in 2001, or it might have been 2002, Oxford University Press paired me with Jill Rubel Kaba, an absolutely fabulous author who writes for young adults. I, I fed her the facts, she did the writing. And they asked us to write a book about ancient Egypt. It was part of a series called The World in Ancient Times, which was spearheaded by Ronald Malore and Amanda Podany. They were meant to be textbooks for sixth graders. Now, Jill and I got along so well that we subsequently co-authored another book for young adults, specifically on the Trojan War, which I personally found very satisfying because it meant I had come full circle from the book that I read when I was seven years old. Now, again, don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing that we should neglect our academic scholarship in favor of just publishing popularizing books. Not at all, not by a long shot. However, I would quote from a distinguished lecture that Jeremy Sabloff gave to the American Anthropological Association about a decade ago in 2010. First, he told them, that we have a moral obligation to educate the public about what we do. And then he said, we need to share with the public our excitement in our work. We also need to share our insights into how the people of the past lived and how our understandings of the past can inform us about the present and the future. And he stressed in particular that we need to share all of this in ways that everyone, from young school children to committed amateur archeologists to government policy makers, can understand and appreciate. And I can personally attest to the latter. It's sometimes startling to realize that some of the things that we write can come to the attention of policymakers. But that's exactly what has happened with me with both Jerusalem Besieged and my 1177 books. I can't tell you more than that, but just say they do read what we write. 
But I can also hear those of you who are tenure track, or who are aiming to be, saying that writing for the general public doesn't usually count as much in tenure or promotion decisions as do articles and journals with the high impact factor. And you also may be worried that you can't publish popularizing articles or books until you have tenure because the powers that be won't think that you're serious enough. And I do mean I hear you, those are very real fears and you are correct to be concerned. Now, how, many, how many of you fall into one of those categories? Yeah. So in fact, there was an article that you might be familiar with. It was published in the Chronicle of Higher Ed at the end of September and it was entitled, Which Publications Matter at Which Stages of Your Career? The part that caused the most chatter on Twitter and Facebook and other social media was when the author said, quote, too many early career scholars seem to be investing their time and energy writing a lot for the wrong kinds of publications. And by wrong, the author says, I mean venues that won't lead to tenure, end quote. And by that, the author specifically means blogs and other postings on social media and other public-facing arenas. While I and others had a gut reaction to that article, and while I completely disagree with its old school arguments, I can also see why the author wrote it. The Egyptologist Aidan Dodson said in a post on Facebook back in April, the powers that be drone on and on about impact, but in practice they do little to encourage the production of attractive synthetic works. And there is also an inverse snobbery still to be found in some corners about selling out and becoming populist. And I would add that I've seen some reviews of popularizing books where the reviewer was clearly either not familiar with or not entirely comfortable with the genre of writing for the public. They literally didn't get it. And the same may well hold true for promotion and tenure committees. So this is where senior scholars need to step up to the plate. In fact, that was my main takeaway from the Chronicle article. Not that it's wrong to be writing blog posts or other public-facing articles, but rather that such should be done in addition to publishing in traditional venues. And I certainly don't want anyone to be denied tenure because of what I'm saying here tonight. Please don't put that on me. Along the same lines, it is absolutely imperative that senior scholars who are on promotion and tenure committees advocate for their younger colleagues who are publishing in non-traditional venues along with traditional venues. It might help to point out that by doing so, the younger scholars are frequently reaching much larger audiences with a popularizing version of the article that they've previously published in a peer-reviewed journal read by just a select few. I'm thinking especially of articles aimed at the general public which appear in a and &E Today or Biblical Archaeology Review after the peer-reviewed version has appeared in AJA or Basor or Tel Aviv or IJA or somewhere else. In fact, in his distinguished lecture to the AAA a de decade ago, Sabloff argued that such popularizing publications should count just as much as academic publications. He said, and I quote, service to the public can certainly be argued to be an essential part of the contribution to the discipline. Effective writing for general audiences requires excellent control of the appropriate literature and the ability to comprehend and articulate clearly the core issues of one's area, time period, or problem. Therefore, it should be subject to the same kind of qualitative academic assessment that ideally goes on today in any academic tenure promotion or hiring procedure. Now, I will say that in the intervening years, in the intervening years since Sabloff said all that back in 2010, things are finally beginning to change, but it is a slow process. In part, it's changing because administrators are realizing that writing for the public can be crucial both for funding and for public support for universities. But I have to admit, even so, and just to be safe, that my own rule of thumb over the years has been to try to publish two scholarly articles, including co-authored pieces, for every popular book or article that I put out. It hasn't come out to exactly that ratio, but it's worked out fairly well, I think, so you might try doing something similar. Now, I can also hear you saying, well, I can't do that. Even if I had a good idea, I can't write an entire popularizing book. 
Now, how many of you have said that to yourself? But to you and to everyone else, I would reply, of course you can do it. All of us have had to slog through writing a dissertation, and some of you are slogging through it right now. For many, that's enough. When you're done, you swear, no more. But we all write. We all write almost every day, whether it's lecture notes for a class or whatever. And those mount up, and they might someday be turned into a book, perhaps much to your surprise. And as I said, that's exactly what happened with my Three Stones Maker Wall book. Now, I'll be the first to admit that writing entire books can be difficult. And in fact, members of the public might rather prefer to read shorter pieces, especially those that they don't have to pay for. So as I said at the beginning of tonight's talk, you might want to start out by trying your hand at something shorter. Blogging, tweeting, writing a short article for Near Eastern Archaeology, or a and &E Today, or Biblical Archaeology Review, if that's what you're more comfortable doing. And by the way, that also goes for those of you who are quite comfortable writing, but who are pressed for time because of your other commitments. There are a number of people doing such things, and others who started out that way who have since gone on to write for places like Forbes and Hyperallergic. I'm thinking here of people who are not necessarily members of ASOR, but who are working in related fields, like David Anderson with Pseudoarchaeology, and Sarah Bond, her pieces on classical archaeology, Christina Kilgrove on bioarchaeology, uh, and again, Candida Moss on religious topics. They're doing it, and so should we. So I would say do whatever it is that you're most, most comfortable doing or have time to do, at least to start with. In fact, Mitchell Allen suggests that if you're a relative newcomer to writing for the public, it might actually be better to discover your public voice by doing such shorter pieces since it's frankly uh, less risky and less of an investment than immediately leaping into a 100,000 word project and occasionally, a shorter piece like that will get picked up by the media, which will spread your ideas far and wide, sometimes quite unexpectedly. Now, many of you know Mitch. Right? He founded both Altamira Press and Left Coast Press after he got his PhD from UCLA with a dissertation on the Neo-Assyrians. And some of you in this audience have actually published books with one or both of those two presses. I consider him to be a writing guru with very sage advice, and I personally consulted with him on numerous occasions. So, what are a few secrets to r successful writing? I'm not a writing guru like Mitch by any stretch of the imagination, nor would I ever pretend to be one, but I can tell you what works for me if that helps. My first suggestion is probably counterintuitive because I would say that the most important thing is not to deliberately set aside specific times to write because that just puts pressure on you during those times when you might not feel like writing. Instead, write whenever and wherever the muse hits. That's what I do. If you're in a position to drop everything and start jotting down notes, thoughts, or even full sentences, do so while you can. Run, do not walk to your nearest computer, grab your iPad or whatever and begin typing. And even if you're not in a position to drop everything, I mean, do not do it while driving, for example, <laughs> grab your phone or the nearest napkin, or the back of an envelope, and begin jotting things down, or even dictating. Use the voice memo function on your phone, for instance, to get your thoughts down while they're flowing and fresh. Even if they're in very rough form, you can always edit them later. And perhaps just as importantly, if nothing is coming to you, don't force it. Go run errands, pay bills, prepare for your next class, write a recommendation letter, I guarantee. Don't you all have Indiana Jones as your alarm on your phone? <laughs> Is it just me? All right, I know I'm running out of time, so, but I'm getting close to finishing, so bear with me. So uh, write a recommendation letter. I guarantee that along the way, something will occur to you out of the blue while you're not forcing yourself to write, and especially if you're procrastinating about doing the other things. Now, when you are writing, though, do it in a space without distraction. Turn off your cell phone. Turn off the Wi-Fi connection on your laptop or desktop and close the door. Either have complete quiet or turn on some music, but if you do put on music, make sure it's quiet in the background so you're not tempted to sing along. 
Sometimes I have sonata, uh, Santana on or some jazz on. Sometimes it's Mozart or Beethoven. It just depends on my mood. The important thing for me is to create a soothing, a soothing atmosphere in which I can let my thoughts flow and my fingers dance over the keyboard without interruption. When I'm in the flow, as it's called, and when my thoughts are tumbling out so quickly that I almost can't type fast enough to keep up, I'll frequently forget to eat or even to stand up for hours at a time, except my watch does remind me once an hour. That can be both good and bad. And when I emerge back into the real world, I often feel as if I've been sculpting or painting, except that I was doing so with words rather than with marble or charcoal or watercolors. And it's a fabulous creative feeling, one that makes me enjoy the journey rather than just trying to get to the destination. Also, I always leave something unfinished when I quit for the day. And I leave a brief note for myself regarding what I was gonna do next. That way I can jump right back in when I begin again because for me, getting started each time is the hardest part. If I can pick right up where I left off, then I'm almost immediately back in the flow. And if you have absolutely no idea where to begin or are having trouble leaving behind the world of stilted academic writing and jargon, or even if you know exactly what to do and how you want to do it, go pick up a copy of the second edition of Brian Fagan's excellent book, Writing Archaeology, Telling Stories About the Past, and follow the instructions that he gives there. It's an invaluable resource and probably the best thing that I've ever read on the topic of how to present archaeology to the public in an interesting and understandable way. And there's also a New York Times science writer Cornelia Dean's book called Am I Making Myself Perfectly Clear? A Scientist's Guide to Talking to the Public. And in addition, Mitch wrote an article about 20 years ago, back in 2002, called Reaching the Hidden Audience, 10 Rules for the Archaeological Writer. It's up on his Academia page if you want to go get it. And in that article, he says, find a hook, tell a story, include yourself. Write in plain English, or Spanish, or Hopi, Talk to a single reader. Use only the data you need and always think of your audience. Now, honestly, it is my dream to see a bunch of publicly accessible tweets, blogs, articles, and books begin to appear and to see all of you on the bestseller list within the next few years. But let me end with a challenge to each and every one of you here tonight. As soon as you can, perhaps even during these meetings or right after they're over. Jot something down about your work which you find interesting and about which you are passionate, something that you think the general public should care about. It could be a small point. It could be an interesting fact, an observation, an informed opinion, or what I would call cocktail party trivia, perhaps even lifted from your presentation if you're giving one here or your poster and then put it out in the public sphere and see what happens. It could be a short tweet with an ace or hashtag, perhaps a post on Facebook or Instagram tonight or tomorrow or the next day. It could be a slightly longer blog post when you get back home or a brief article for a &E Today that you submit in a few weeks. Every bit counts and you never know where it might take you. And please, let me know when you've done it. I'll try to keep track of what everyone's done and report back on how we're doing. Now, I realize there may be some of you, maybe even many of you, who just don't feel like doing any of this. And I certainly respect that, and I thank you for listening to me politely this evening. However, if the rest of you who are here tonight take me up on this challenge and can write something that Ivan and Reuben and Smelly Mike and Honey would want to read, I believe that our field our students, and the general public will all be the better for it. We need to do it. ASOR needs us to do it. Thank you. We have time for questions? Okay. I'll try. I can't see you, so somebody. Oh, there's a microphone coming around? All right. 
Thank you so much. That was inspirational. Um, but you are also talking to a room full of introverts who are a little bit afraid of being internet famous. Could you talk a little about hate mail and internet trolls and how you deal with the dark side of this? Yeah, there is that. I think we each have to deal with that in our own way. I try, I usually keep my, my posts to a minimum. And what I mostly do, both on, on Twitter and Facebook, is repost articles that are of interest to me that I think will be of interest to other people. Um, I personally have almost never made a political comment on there, which is what gets that in there. Uh, but I do know that this is a problem. I mean, I'm watching Sarah Parkak deal with it on an almost daily basis. Right, so I don't have an answer to it, except if it's not for you, then don't do this. But um, I also think that uh, in our field especially, uh, we, we all over time develop a very thick skin, and that may be one way to start developing it. But yeah, it is a very real problem, and I would admit to that. Right, and in terms of being an introvert, yeah, but you know, we need to unite. <laughs> Sorry, old joke. Eric, as though to underline your point about the interest that's out there, after a lecture a couple of nights ago in Tucson, I was sitting in a bar, closing the place down, and talking with a couple of colleagues about what we do. And suddenly it occurred to me, almost everybody at the bar had turned around and was listening to us. And then a man had the nerve to come over and say, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to intervene, but this is fascinating. And we sat for an hour talking with him, and he was a reporter. Very good, very good. And your books especially reach the general public, so thank you for those. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much. This is really interesting. Um, but if I may add a comment to add to this, uh, I think an important uh, venue for engaging with the audience is also through museum exhibits. And that this is another way to uh, speak to the public in another voice and you know, put the words out there as well. So looking also at archeology span museums and ways that academics can engage with the public in that sphere. Right, I think there are any number of ways. And again, it's whatever you're comfortable doing, but I do think we need to reach the public more than we are. And I think we can do it, but yes. Yeah, so any way you can do it, absolutely. Eric, bless you. I've followed you for many years. We've talked for many years about this reaching out to the public here at ASUR. And thank you very, very much for your comments tonight. It is so essential to do this. If you don't do it, the wackos will. Quite seriously. One of the things I would like to point out or ask about, I'm an old social studies teacher. I know what's happening in my field. Somehow people involved in the ancient world need to get into those organizations that are forming standards, the frightening standards. If you don't get in there, it's going to be, I, and I'm not sure the access to that, but it's going to be <coughs> facing the old course where you spend an entire year on 5,000 years of history. <coughs> and therefore, we post hole and badly. And there's a lot of awful stuff that's happening out there right now in forming standards and writing curriculum and writing textbooks at the secondary school level. And those are the kids that are going to be going into your classes or not by the time they get to university. So it's not just... Eric's absolutely right, it's writing the articles and things like that, but it's also trying to undermine the system. And it's a tough system. And it's not, often it is not 
touched by the scholars such as yourselves who are the ones who really know the story. Right. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. Um, Eric, I just had a question. You were when you were listing uh, some of the options we have. You said uh, Twitter or or other social media v um, outlets, but what about YouTube and um, people studying? Because I found that most people find their historical resources from YouTube, mm -hmm. and so I don't think that uh, scholars are taking advantage of the platform of YouTube and also connecting with. Um, animators or digi digital uh, people who are in digital arts and connecting that and making it more visual and more, most of the time people are drawn to the visual aspect of right. ancient history. So I just was curious at what you thought about utilizing uh, YouTube or something like right. that. Right, you're absolutely right. Yes, I completely left that out. But yes, YouTube, podcasts, all of that, they absolutely reach. Um, and I can attest to that, some of you know. Um, I gave a lecture a couple of years ago. There were 50 people in the audience, I think. It was on 1177. Uh, they posted it on YouTube. As of today, I think it hit 3.4 million views. I have no idea who's watching it. <laughs> but yes, the power of YouTube is out there. So the one thing I might suggest, because I had no control over posting it, and um, I don't give it any revenue from it. I wish I did, but <laughs> if there's an opportunity to tape yourself while you're giving a public lecture and to upload it to YouTube, that is a great way to reach the public, especially the, uh, the younger generation that just sits there and watches, but I mean, I do as well. So yeah, absolutely. I think YouTube would be great. Thank you for that comment. Right, and podcasts are also getting people out there. Uh, if you're into doing podcasts, there's a, a, a world that needs you out there. So, um, and there's a whole mess of technology that I'm just getting too old to master. But yes, so any way you can do it, get the voice out there. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to say um, that was a really excellent uh, uh, argument in favor of writing for the public ar audience. and. I must confess a lot of my writing has not been to the, for a public audience navigating the tenure track process and you've sort of really kind of sold me in a lot of ways on kind of shifting more in that direction. Um, I kept thinking when you were making arguments about like why we should r write to the general public, the, your sort of core arguments were twofold. One, um, that we need to keep our field vibrant through public funding and through even donors to, to uh, Near Eastern Studies and, and Archaeology. Um, and also um, that we, uh, we want to entertain and sort of educate our audience. But I think I, I wanted to sort of add one comment, because to me what really strikes me also that you're sort of touching on there is that when we think of the problems we face as a current uh, you know, global population and in the future, we also have answers or partial answers or information about things like climate change, warfare, political intrigue and infighting and global disagreements and geopolitics that I think um, hold lessons for things that the public is interested about, interested in and that are challenges that we fa face as a global community and a society, right? So um, that to me is like one thing that's really inspiring about archeology span is that we want to educate and entertain the public, but we even have more than that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we can maybe uh, add our scholarly contributions to these grand issues while also being entertaining and interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and that's like really, uh, it seems to me, the, what really makes it challenging, right? How do you make scholarly points but make them in entertaining ways? So mm -hmm. um, I think you're you're making a really inspiring contribution and in getting us to think, you know, in cool. that direction about how to reach a, a wider audience of the public, so thank you. Well, and I thank you in return for that comment. You're absolutely right. Um, Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, and, and that has been seen. And I do think that's a lot of what 
some of what we do resonates with the public. I, I think that's why 1177 is doing so well, because everybody's afraid that we're going to collapse, and what did they do back in the Bronze Age? Uh, and uh, something like Jerusalem Besieged, I wrote it for the State Department. I'm like, if you're going to keep sending people over there, you need to know what the history of the region was, you know, and you're walking into a minefield, that kind of thing. So yes, I think we have absolutely important contributions, including to the climate change debate and all of that. So. Um, yeah, uh, and you might think that what you're working on is not relevant at all, but it is. And I think if, you, if, if we just stop and think a moment that, that there would be something there. So yes, thank you. Absolutely valid. Thank you. Hey, Eric, Dan here from Megiddo. Hey, listen, but I also like suggest that ASOR get more involved. Uh, I uh, invite students to come up uh, and hear my lecture. And I think ASOR should open up the door so they allow the students to come in. Uh, a couple years ago at Atlanta, I had 30 students come from, uh, pay their way up, spend the night, just to hear me lecture there at uh, Atlanta. They, I kind of got in trouble because they all came in. I didn't know they were all coming, but uh, I uh, mentioned that to them. So, hey, sort of my think about that. Uh, I've always had students that want to get out of a paper. They come and hear the lecture. They get out of a paper, and, and some of them have gone on to be archaeologists. So, nice. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Thank you. Um, I think probably the most important thing you said was what you started with, that if we don't tell our stories, someone else will. And I think we also have to be aware that um, there are many right-wing policy think tanks that are setting up universities as straw men, characterizing all academics as left-wing, postmodern, feminist, Marxists, whatevers. And they <laughs> are denigrating our right to exist, and we're getting cut when we should be telling our stories and not letting them tell our stories. And I think here it's also important to mention the blog Faros, which um, is out of Vassar College. I don't know if you know it, but what it tries to do is shine a light on these various alt-right think tanks, speakers, podcasters, some of whom get a million hits. And I think we really need to work fast to take back our message or we won't be around to give our message. Thank you, Luis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I work in post-ISIS Iraq, so one thing that struck me is you highlighted six things from the ASOR uh, mission statement, but you cut off the end of the six, which said that we should work in the indigenous language of the country we work in. Uh, so my question is to that, like I, I know a lot of us would publish first in English, how much do you consciously reach out in Arabic and Hebrew and the other languages so that the, lang the, the local people of the communities we work in are hearing us, uh, our point of view and part of the dialogue? That's a, a great point, right. Frequently it's not up to us to do it, like I personally can't write in Arabic, but uh, if you write a piece and you put it in the proper place, someone will translate it and get it out there, right. So 1177, for example, is about to come out in Arabic, right? But we have no control over that. That's up to the publishers to do that, right? But I absolutely agree. Get it into, the, into other languages, and it works, absolutely. Yeah, so I think that would be important. But you can always feed a piece to some place and say, can you translate this and get it out? So yeah, I absolutely agree. How do you think fiction plays into this role? S sorry, how do I think? How do you think fiction plays into this? Ah, excellent, excellent question. How does fiction play a role? Uh, uh, an important one, if it's historically accurate, I would say. Um, I was uh, working, uh, or I've been approached by a number of people over the years. Uh, to give them feedback, and I always am happy to give them feedback and say this, this isn't right, this isn't right, this is right, this is right. Um, and for instance, I think it was Judith Starkston wrote a book on, uh, on Troy and uh, Hand of Fire, and uh, I, I helped her by reading part of it, but it was a marvelous book and fairly accurate. So uh, I think writing fiction, if it's done well and done accurately, is um, part and parcel of the same thing we're talking about, absolutely. 
I mean, just look at Michener's The Source. How many people have read The Source? That was a work of complete fiction. It was based on reality, right? Based on Megiddo and Hatsor and, and all the archaeologists of that time, right? Ruth Amaran and Yigal Yudin and Aharoni and all that. But it was fiction, and yet it was accurate, at least for 1965. So, yeah, so if you're more comfortable writing fiction, more power to you. I personally am terrible at writing fiction. I tried it once. It was my first rejected manuscript. Uh, but, but if you can do it, absolutely. I think it's a great way to go. Yeah, look, any way we can reach them, as long as it's accurate. Yeah. So, um, thank you all for being here tonight, for your questions. Thanks especially to Eric. I'd like to invite you to join us for a reception in the Crystal Ballroom. I have no idea where that is, but um, <laughs> it must be in this hotel somewhere. But before we leave for the Crystal Ballroom, if I could ask you to join me just once more in thanking Eric for his lecture tonight. <laughs>